Hey, aloha everybody. Uh, I hope you had fun working through that phylogeny. That phylogeny is a little tricky, right? I mean, it uh, represents diversity of vertebrates and invertebrates. Uh, and this is what that, that character matrix looked like. Um, and so you can kind of see that there's, and I've got this kind of color coded here. Um, there are traits that end up early on separating these two major lineages. And uh, I've got those highlighted, these kind of two major lineages that, that, uh, that pop up in kind of that yellow and that kind of green. Uh, and this is whether or not, and if you look at that character matrix, you can see that there's this trait that's kind of mutually exclusive there of being either a deuterostome or, or a protostome. And so the deuterostomes are all down there at the bottom in green. The protostomes are in those, that yellow uh, category right there in that, <clears throat> in that branch, that lineage that comes off. Uh, with flatworms all the way down through insects. And there's a few other cases where, you know, you get a similar breakup. Uh, for example, down in the bottom there from lizards and snakes all the way down to placentals. There's one trait that kind of splits up those two lineages, uh, with lizards, snakes, crocodiles, and birds from uh, mammals, monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. Um, <clears throat> and you can see those are highlighted there in red. So this is uh, this distinction between being a diapsid or a synapsid. And so it's really essential when you're working through these phylogenies to look at uh, those uh, types of uh, uh, groupings of characteristics uh, or groupings of individuals based on certain characteristics that, that really kind of break up these broader lineages. And then within those lineages, you can look at all those different relationships. So here's that completed phylogeny. Uh, and I'm giving you guys this PDF, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want, you, I want you to compare it to what you have and what you were able to come up with and start looking for, for trends within it. Uh, what I'm going to do really briefly, and, and I'm just going to let you guys kind of work through this on your own as well. I'm going to try to get to the um, uh, kind of the big transitions rather, rather quickly, but I've just kind of gone through and highlighted uh, what some of these different groups are, okay, so and some different examples of things. So this is sponges, nidari sponges, nidarians, uh, anelid wor flatworms, uh, and anelids, and then mollusks. Right, that's kind of that first big grouping right there. Uh, and then we've got roundworms, uh, which are nematodes. We've got crustaceans, and we've got insects. Uh, down here, we've got sort of our echinoderms all the way down through our bony fish. So we've got uh, that includes echinoderms, tunicates, sharks and rays, which are elasmobranchs. Uh, bony fish, oste osteichthys, right? Oste, meaning bone, like osteoporosis, right? Think about that. Uh, and then we've got our tetrapods, which are amphibians all the way down to those placentals. Uh, the first couple of pairings here, we've got amphibians, which broke off pretty early. And then we've got our, our, our reptiles, right? Which are really our, our diapsids here, which are lizards and snakes, uh, crocodiles, and then birds, which also belong to that broad grouping. And we've got this last uh, lineage here, which is uh, comprised of mammals. And so we've got three different types of mammals. We've got monotremes, which include things like the echidna and the duck-billed platypus. So they're strange. They start to they produce milk, but they still lay eggs, and they are warm-blooded, and they have fur. But anyway, they're just this weird mix of things. Uh, marsupials also produce milk. They also give live birth. They give live birth. Uh, they, um, they have fur. They have hair. Uh, but instead of... They, they actually give, instead of uh, laying an egg, they give birth to a really, really uh, premature baby, and then that baby develops inside this pouch. And they have placental mammals, which uh, hold on to their baby inside of the body and feed their baby via the placenta uh, until, you know, as, for as long as possible, basically, in many cases up to almost a year or, or more. Uh, and then they give birth to a relatively mature uh, a relatively precocious uh, offspring that's then a little, a little better equipped uh, to live in the outside world. So let's walk through a few of the major transitions that I had you think about and talk about. <clears throat> First one's bilateral symmetry. So remember, we talked about this in the overview of animal diversity. This led to increased mobility <clears throat> where you've got radial animals that are oftentimes like stuck in place or sessile or they're planktonic. Uh, and this symmetry, this bilateral symmetry allows organisms to take the world head on, whereas that radial symmetry allows them to sort of, uh, uh, you know, meet their environment equally well on all sides. 
Another point here is that bilateral organisms uh, have a much more developed central nervous system and that enables them to coordinate these really complex movements. And so that, <clears throat> that bilateral symmetry is super important when it came to driving the diversity of, of animals because it increased uh, you know, sort of the intensity of these interactions among species of predator prey interactions and competition that led to new adaptations to catch prey or to avoid being eaten. Uh, another important trait was the evolution of uh, vertebrae. So this led to or was uh, resulted from this duplication of Hox genes, which we talked about previously. Uh, in most vertebrates, the vertebrae actually encloses and protects the spinal cord. And then <clears throat> together with the muscular system, this uh, vertebrae helps coordinate more complex movement. Okay, so we've got some really cool stuff going on there. Tetrapody, uh, the evolution of four limbs and sort of moving on to land uh, was another really important characteristic in animals and vertebrates in particular. Uh, this facilitated that land, uh, that transition to land and then eventually to the air. So what's thought to have happened here was that sort of lobed fins in ancient fishes uh, gave rise to limbs and feet that could support the tetrapod's weight on land. And the feet specifically eventually evolved in the digits to efficiently transmit the energy from the muscles to uh, the ground so that they could effectively move across the ground. And this is uh, this particular animal right here in this image is Tiktaalik, which is this really cool transitional species uh, that uh, was probably one of the first tetrapods. And it has this kind of it's this weird kind of middle ground between uh, something that we would see in the water versus something that we'd see on land, this kind of amphibious organism. Um, another big one was the evolution of amniotic eggs. And you could think of this, you know, this is almost like the evolution of seeds in plants. This is something that really allowed animals to get even further away from uh, from water. If you think about amphibians, they're still kind of tied to their, the first tetrapods, right? First animals to start to move onto land, the vertebrate animals to move onto land. Um, but uh, but they were still tied to that moisture from rep for reproduction. But the evolution of the amniotic egg allowed animals to become even more independent of water, much as in the same way that the evolution of seeds allowed animals to become more plants to become more independent of water. So this is a derived trait of the group that we call amniotes. <clears throat> this was a huge innovation for living on land for terrestrial life because it allowed the embryo to develop in sort of a private pond in this kind of self-contained private pond within that amniotic egg. Uh, the shell slows dehydration of the embryo. There are specialized tissues within the shell that allow for the storage of wastes, transportation of nutrients, the uh, transportation of gases. Uh, in some species, that embryo ends up developing within the amnion inside the mother's body. So that was something that evolved later is that A was then sort of retained in the body, uh, and, and we call that uh, viviparity. And so there's a few different forms of that. Uh, the true viviparity is when an uh, organism gives birth to live young, and the young obtain nutrients from the mother's blood directly through uh, what's called a yolk sac placenta. So that's actually derived from that amniotic egg. Uh, ovip oviparous species, which lay eggs that hatch outside of the mother's body, uh, and then ovoviviparous species are those that retain fertilized eggs in the body, in the oviduct. Those those eggs then hatch in the uterus, and then they get nutri and they get nutrition from egg yolk, not from a placenta. But they basically so it's basically an egg that's retained in the body, uh, and it and the embryo develops in a way that's very similar to the way it would be developing in an egg outside of the body, and then they give birth to live young. <clears throat> so I want you to think about. You know, what are some advantages of live birth and what are some possible disadvantages? Um, so advantages could be, so I mean, if you're able to carry your young around, that might be that might be nice, right? You could uh, kind of, you know, you don't have to worry about leaving your, your eggs behind and your nest being vulnerable. You can kind of always have them with you. Uh, but at the same time, that presents a challenge because then you have all those eggs in your body or these developing embryos in your body and that can increase weight make animals more sluggish, make them more vulnerable to predators. Uh, and so those are some possible disadvantages there. Uh, viviparity has actually evolved many, many, many times. We oftentimes think of this as a mammalian trait, as mammals giving birth to live young. 
and that's true this is a mammalian trait for placental mammals and um, and uh, marsupials uh, but there are many 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 other lineages that have independently evolved viviparity including things like cockroaches which is disgusting uh, lots of fish are, vi are viviparous they give birth to live young and actually many many different lineages some fish even have like a pseudo placenta uh, lots and lots of variation in terms of of that reproductive uh, output so hopefully that was helpful and i'll put up another video as well about uh, that phylogeny to make sure you're just you know you're able to work through that uh, well and and understand how we got to that process or that that end outcome